Welcome back to the Neurophilia Podcast. As always, I am your host, Nuper Goyle. In today's episode, we will be discussing the interplay between neurology and dermatology. Compared to our last episode, a talk between neurology and cardiology, the relationship between neurology and dermatology is less described in scientific literature and less defined in medical practice. However, with closer examination, one can begin to appreciate the significant overlap between these two fields of medicine. Anatomically, the skin and nervous system share the same embryological origin and interact through a neurocutaneous immune system. Pathologically, over 300 genetic and acquired diseases can primarily affect both organ systems. To name a few, neurocutaneous disorders, stroke, neuropathy, infection, malignancy, autoimmune etiologies, and other chronic medical conditions. Recent work in neurodegenerative disease suggests a significant correlation between Parkinson's disease and various dermatological disorders, such as seborrheic dermatitis and rosacea. Additionally, 30 to as high as 60% of patients with dermatological disease will also have coexisting psychiatric conditions. For a more in-depth review of all statistics and literature discussed, please check out our episode's description for more information. In a 1999 article titled Neurology and the Skin, Drs. Herko and Provost write, the complementary and some would say diametrically opposite clinical methods of a dermatologist and the neurologist can reduce an otherwise dauntingly large differential into a more tractable smaller list. And, you know, I found this quote utterly fascinating because it hints at this intricate, dynamic, and crucial association between neurology and dermatology. And so the purpose of today's episode is to further discuss the complementary and perhaps diametrically opposed relationship between these two fields of medicine. To do so, I have with me neurophilia co-host and vascular neurologist, Dr. Blake Baletko, and special guest, Dr. Elliot Mosto. Dr. Elliot Mosto is the professor and chair of the dermatology section at Northeast Ohio Medical University. He is the president of Akron Dermatology and has served the Akron, Ohio community for nearly 30 years. He is extremely passionate about excellence in medical education, prevention of errors in medicine, and medical ethics. Dr. Elliot Mosto, thank you so much for joining us on the Neurophilia podcast. We are so excited and humbled to have you here. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. So I just want to jump straight into this conversation because when it when it came to this idea of neurology and dermatology, I wasn't sure if I was going to find too much on the subject matter, but I was actually very pleasantly surprised as I as I alluded to in the introduction of this episode. And so, you know, Dr. Mostel, being a very well-seasoned, experienced dermatologist, can you sort of talk us through the different types of interactions you've had with the field of neurology? Uh, sure. Uh, first, again, and, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. The the article you pulled uh, by Tom Provost is the senior author, and I, I didn't know the other person who's probably a neurologist. Tom Provost was head of dermatology at um, Johns Hopkins for years, and just a great guy. I'm, I'm pretty sure he's not living, although I, I could be wrong on that one. Um, but excellent speaker, great clinician. Um, he put together an exhaustive and amazing list. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, the common things that we see in dermatology are clearly, I, I saw one of my favorite neurofibromatosis patients the other day. We see all sorts of people. Um, I, I don't know what the um, incidence and prevalence is of Parkinson's disease these days, but it, it, it's significant enough. People are living longer and they clearly do have rosacea, seborrheic dermatitis, and all the other skin problems that people living longer get, like skin cancers. Um, and so th those are probably my two most common ones. And absolutely, you, you nailed it, uh, thinking about neurocutaneous um, situations, whether that's delusions of parasitosis or just the fact people can see their skin. And so there's a lot of anxiety of, of you know, what, what's going on with me. Absolutely. Yeah, I, Sorry, Nooper. I was just going to say, too, I, I uh, agree that whenever you approached me and said, let's do a talk on neurology and dermatology outside of the neurocutaneous disorders, I kind of scratched my head and I said, well, uh, 
I guess in, in one sense, and you kind of open with this, you know, the ectoderm uh, goes way back and, and we have that in common. And then after that, in the neurocutaneous disorders, I said, I'll be interested to see kind of where we can take this and what we can talk about. And, you know, just even within my own practice, within vascular neurology, there's been a lot of systemic vasculitides that we've diagnosed with the, the help of dermatology through skin biopsy. You know, something that we see infrequently, but affects especially some of our younger patients with strokes would be catacil. And one of the ways that we can diagnose catacil would be through a skin biopsy looking for the notch three gene. So there have been plenty of patients that um, we have been co-managing uh, amongst dermatologists and neurologists um, with even in my own vascular practice that has actually been really, really, really helpful. And I know that we're going to talk a little bit more about our, our interaction and how we do this. I would say too, metastatic melanoma, uh, melanoma loves the brain. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we love the brain in a different way. And I wish that <laughs> melanoma did not love the brain as much as what it does. Um, but you know, uh, melanoma can be very hazardous to the brain. And I see a lot of ICH patients that come in that end up being metastatic melanoma. And oftentimes mm -hmm. it's going back and doing a good skin assessment and finding out uh, for the diagnosis. I would also just add too, and, and maybe uh, Elliot will disagree with me or, or roll his eyes, but we see a lot of medication effects. You know, we prescribe a ton of medications and I'll be very honest, uh, when we don't know what's happening and we started a new medication, we often say, uh-oh, we scratch our head and we say, let's get you to see a dermatologist so that they can actually uh, put this together for us. Because oftentimes a lot of our patients have a ton of comorbidities or a ton of medications and really trying to figure out, is this part of the syndrome or is this a medication can often be really helpful. Yeah, well, you and I can both agree that it would be great in 2023, maybe it'll be 2024, that we can actually put a, a probe or even do a skin biopsy and we could say, oh, you're reacting to this drug among your 20 medications. Wouldn't that be nice? Seems like there should be a way, but we're, we're not there yet. You know, it's nice when it's easy. You start something and uh, they get a rash and, you know, we, we say, well, that's the problem. You know, and, and to be honest with you, a lot of your anti-epileptics are, are causes of relatively frequent causes of severe drug reactions, toxic epidermal necrolysis, Stevens Johnson's, and, you know, it, it, you know, it's fine when it's sort of a more banal um, drug reaction. Lamotrigine, I get scared of every time I think of starting it only because it's one of the best medications that we have. It's very well tolerated. Um, it's a good medication to use in young women. Uh, and yet at the same point, it, as being outside of an epileptologist who does this day in and day out, it's really uh, almost scary because that's all you hear about is the potential reactions that you can have that can be very, very severe and even life-threatening. So completely agree. Yeah, although, you know, it's it's a funny thing. You and I were talking about just the art of medicine uh, to, to begin with. And, uh, you know, in the dermatology world, uh, you know, we see cases of severe drug reactions to, you know, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. And, and so dermatologists are clearly less likely to write for that. However, in the primary care world, it's, you know, it's like water. I mean, it's uh, not not that it necessarily should be, and certainly antibiotic stewardship is a, a very real concept that all physicians are trying to address these days. But uh, uh, you know, just just interesting in terms of practice patterns. I won't be prescribing uh, the metrogene. Well, already, I mean, you know, as as Dr. Valleco mentioned, although looking back in terms of our embryological derivation derivatives um you know the the skin and the brain have the same ancestors but you know as you both have already elicited there is this underlying huge connection when you when you take a, a closer look at sort of the patients you get to deal with um, from either genetic conditions as well as these acquired conditions. And, and when you bring in this idea of medication effects and the dermatological complications that you can have as a result, there's this huge array that, that both a neurologist and a dermatologist need to work closely together to help manage. Um, and, and honestly, you know, in, in that great article back when it was published in 1999, I found this quote, this, this idea of a neurologist and a dermatologist having this complementary as well as diametrically opposite clinical approach. I just thought the idea of it was just so fascinating. And 
complex to understand. And so I'm curious to know, you know, Dr. Mosto, Dr. Boletko, in, in your practice, how do you approach patients? And, and how would you say that the clinical approach of a neuro, uh, of a neurologist and a dermatologist complement each other? And, and where do it, where does it oppose each other? That's a great, uh, that's a great question. You know, the, during, you know, we talk about, you know, the SOAP approach to medicine, right? Subjective, objective uh, assessment and plan. So from that sort of thinking, dermatology is really more OSAP, right? It, it's, you know, I look, I, I, I have often an instant differential based on what I'm seeing. Um, and then think about what the patient is telling me and, um, come up with an assessment and differential diagnosis and plan. And my sense is, Blake, that you're going to tell me that uh, you do a lot more listening and then testing and and because um, oftentimes you, you don't see anything and, and you're depending on the patient to give you, well, if you're doing, you know, specific, you know, testing, you can find that. But I, I think the clinical neurologic exam is, is you know, got to be much more detective work and specific. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that quote, and I was thinking of more commonalities than than not. Um, I can think of a lot of other uh, specialties of medicine that I would think are more opposite to neurology than dermatology, perhaps. Um, one thing that jumped out to me was the physical exam. I think that neurologists pride uh, themselves and ourselves on being able to do a really good, thorough physical exam. And to, to your point, Elliot, I think that you would also say that the physical exam is extremely important to dermatologists. And so I think that the overlap there is maybe the clearest kind of commonality that we have is really we rely a lot on our exam and we rely a lot on what we're seeing. I would agree that uh, just based off of my limited exposure to dermatology uh, through medical school and a little bit through residency, I can tell you that the time spent maybe in some uh, circumstances getting that history and really hearing the story and then being able to tell a story back in neurology is probably very different. I'm not sure what your practice um, is like as far as how much time you have for, for patients and how quickly you can make a diagnosis versus I think it takes us a lot longer to make a diagnosis a lot of times. So um, I always envy the fact that you can almost send a picture to a dermatologist and half the time, if not more, they can give you a pretty good diagnosis just by looking at something. And I think that that's pretty special. And that's something that I don't think that we can do in neurology. I, I can't imagine you could. I mean, you're, you're, you're doing the, the house wiring, right? Every, everywhere from the brain to uh, what's going out on our, uh, you know, you know, all, all through the periphery. So there, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of wires. We're, and of course, it depends in dermatology. There are many things that, you know, honestly, within there's the instant, you know, diagnosis. And, um, you know, of course, it, you've probably read that book, Blink, uh, that um, and uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote. Yeah. And, and it's how we get it right with a snap decision and how we get it wrong. And, and so even if you make a snap decision, you have to take a breath and say, okay, well, you know, could it be something else and, and test yourself? But, uh, you know, commonly that's the case. I and mean, certainly, you know, to be honest with you, I, I saw this great patient with type one neurofibromatosis the other day. And this guy is just, you know, he has hundreds and hundreds of neurofibromas and he's got all sorts of cafe au lait macules. And he's a very nice guy who's had very little sort of systemic problems other than uh, pain in these things. And, and he, he's just a good example of somebody who carries on with life with a good attitude. He's got a kid with a, 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 um, a few neurofibromas at this point. And he feels a little badly about that, but he's sort of moving forward because he's been so, he's been a truly productive member of society. I would say too, I was thinking through, you know, what else do we have in common? And maybe one of the other things that I thought of was we both see a lot of uh, in our own respective fields, we see a lot of end-stage systemic disorders. So we can mm -hmm. talk about primary disorders for the skin and the brain uh, as much as we want, and maybe it's harder to find uh, some middle ground there. But I think if we look at you know some you know systematic or system systemic uh, disorders, I think that probably both of us see a lot of these disorders that affect the skin and the brain. Uh, alike. And sometimes that's where we both come in and we're consultants and we're trying to figure out what the diagnosis is. 
I know that lupus can be a very common one in different vasculitides, as we mentioned earlier. So that was one other part of uh, you and I that I think might have, we might have some overlap there is seeing more systemic disorders that are affecting both of our organ systems independently. Yeah, it, you know, it, it's a funny thing, um, Newford, talking about things that are, you know, different approaches to things. I mean, they're both detective work. I mean, there, there's, you know, that, that's all there is to it. And thinking about, you know, you certainly, it's certainly not that when you see a stroke victim with certain symptoms, you, we, we were talking earlier, certain things have to be really um, straightforward to preserve everything you can uh, in the cognitive sense. I mean, the, the people listening can't see me tapping my head, but that's what I was doing. Um, and um, these have to be rapid fire decisions and you, you, you are making snap decisions at that point. Uh, and then of course, when you end up later finding out perhaps they have you know, anti-cardiolipin syndrome or something that we, we get to and you find out, oh, well, that explains it. You know, they, they had miscarriages. You know, we're, you know, the detective work of medicine is just, you know, fantastic. You can really make a huge difference when you, you nail the, nail the diagnosis. And I think um, neurology and dermatology are similar in the sense, you know, as, as consultants, um, Plenty of people say, well, I just don't know enough about this, you know, so in, in fact, you serve a purpose when you do something all the time. Uh, it's nice that you sort of take an, an organ system, if you will, and uh, you, you, you dig a little deeper and, you know, some of it becomes routine and enough of it becomes not routine that you really um, keeps it interesting. Absolutely. Well, I think I mean, truly, when you guys talk about this difference in approach, but still placing so much emphasis on on the history of a patient as well as how they physically look, um, it's you know the obviously the the most interesting part of that quote is that this idea of it being complementary as well as diametrically opposite. But but the last part of it's also important that both of your approaches, whether you're in dermatology and you're focusing more on how the patient objectively looks, or you're the neurologist taking an hour long history to sort of help, both of those approaches, regardless of where you put that emphasis on, allows you to take this, you know, broad and overwhelming differential for a lot of these patients and find ways to make it this small list that is more um, approachable for, for the common for person, for the common physician. Um, and so I think what both of you do, regardless of the way that you get to that end result, has that same picture of it being, you know, better for the patient at the end of the day. And so, I mean, truly what a, what an interesting and what a cool conversation. And, um, you know, Dr. Mosto, I have obviously this connection with you and, you know, we worked together in the past and, and something that, you're really passionate about is medical education and finding a way to help students um, learn more, not only about dermatology, but about other fields of medicine. Um, and, and something of you that I just find so inspiring is, is, is your passion for the ABCs. And, and while you typically, you know, attribute that to the field of dermatology, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the ABCs and what that means and, and how it can go outside of dermatology and perhaps relate to neurology. So Newper, thanks for asking about one of my favorite topics. Um, and Blake, you perhaps you you watched uh, the TED talk I did, and and uh, I, and that's really where we met Newper by curating a, a TED event. Um, but I, for years, I've been um, I, I think a lot about how we hone our sensory skills as clinicians, and and whether you're primary care or a specialist in any physician, even, even a non-direct non patient care radiologist, we, we need to have our senses together. Uh, and, and, it, and, and so I was really asked to give a talk on um, a grand rounds uh, on uh, dermatology. And I'd read the day before a, an article in the New York Times about a program at, um, I believe it was at NYU, uh, where they were taking medical students to the art museum and talking about works of art. And I said, well, that's great. Um, and so the the ABCs, though, are art, birds, and, and now cooking. But I, I said, uh, I just was coming back from Florida when I read the article. They, they wanted the title for this grand rounds I was going to give. And I said, okay, let's do the ABCs of dermatology using art, uh, bird watching, and 
at the time, which was 15 years ago when I first started on this, maybe more, uh, I used computers, art, bird watching, and computers to enhance your visual skills in, in medicine, in dermatology or medicine. Um, and I realized I, I loved this talk. This was a great talk that had life to it. I've adapted it to medicine grand rounds. I've uh, I even did one surgical grand rounds uh, on it because it, it's it's the same for all of us. And so, I, I, and during COVID, um, we were home. We weren't going out to eat as much, and we were cooking more. And I decided it was re time to retire computers because. Computers were new and interesting once. And I mean, they're still interesting, but um, everyone has one now uh, and, and knows, has their own sort of niche for it. But cooking, I decided, was a really nice fit. And it, it was really the visual and sensory part of cooking. So I, I gave a talk talking about the ABCs of using art, visual, sensory, um, art can be lots of things to everyone, uh, bird watching, looking at shapes and colors and, and timing. And then cooking, which takes in, you know, sort of the other nuances, you know, not only the visual part, but um, the sensory part. And, and then also we, we talked a little bit about the human part, the part about connecting with people. And, and that's, I, I think, a big part about cooking and eating. So, so I don't know, Nooper, you can stop me. I don't want to go on forever. You, you liked it. It got me to think about, well, other people like it too. It, it also got me thinking about, a good friend said to me, Elliot, this ABCs is nice, but what's really important about this? What, you know, wh why are you, why are you, why are these sensory skills important for you and Blake and other people? And I, I uh, what is it we're really doing? And, and what we're doing got me to, you know, the, the sad part was I sort of changed my TED talk at the very end because my friend Harvey was pushing me on this. Um, but what we do is we focus, we, we pay attention to something. We expand our thinking. We think about a differential. I mean, this is really where, where you get good at things. You show some humility, realize you don't know everything. And then we also pay attention to detail. And, and in your world and my world, you know, that's what we're doing. Focus, expand our thinking, pay attention to detail. So it's ABC and FED, right? You know. Well, well, Dr. Mosto, I could I could hear you give your TED talk again. I mean, I, I I truly find this idea so fascinating. And, you know, at the time, I didn't really think about how relevant it is to neurology, this idea of being completely present and aware when it comes to all the senses that you have, because, you know, as you both alluded to neurology as well as dermatology is one of, you know, the few fields of medicine left where like the physical exam and the patient's story is truly at the heart of what you do. Instead of being focused on radiographic findings and other types of imaging and lab work, being able to truly be present with the patient is important. And so having those skills, um, whether they be art watching, cooking, or computers, depending on your timing, I, I think it's it's really important to, to talk about. And, um, you know, going back to that study that you mentioned, I actually found it. it, it the, the first place that this was described was actually at Yale University back in, in 2001 by Dr. Braverman, who was also a dermatologist. Um, and it was called the Yale Center for British Art Project. And they had about 90 students every single year from about the 1980s to the early 2000s. Um, and they saw this huge growth and ability in students that would go to the art museum and just spend a couple minutes looking at an artwork in their ability to describe findings, to understand pathology compared to, to, to students who would just sit in classrooms or listen to lectures from professors. And so I think there's a lot of, of value to this idea of, of being completely aware and present with, with your senses and um, visual skills around you. Yeah, so, so much of, um, but there's so many issues involved that come into this, but but not the least of which is um, this idea of burnout, if you want to use that word, moral fatigue, things around us that, you know, even medical school, is it, it's hard. Um, so finding joy in things that can also make you a better physician, it's really wonderful. So taking that time at the art museum, I, I don't know, did you come the night we did the creatives in medicine session at the art museum? We, uh, Blake, we recently did a session at the Akron Art Museum. 
uh, and we enlisted the the guy who's the um, John Fiumi, who's the current um, CEO of the art museum, and we got a curator, and and we just had a for me it was a fun night. I think all the students who came had a great night. So it was it it, it hit a home run on on every level, and we had a little bit of food there, so it was it was good. No birds. So. Uh, Humanism and medicine, uh, I, I think it's uh, maybe underutilized. And so I've, I've loved hearing everything that you've just said. And I think you brought up another good point that we talked about on the first episode. And that's sometimes uh, I think you have to be okay with saying you don't know. And there has to be um, a sense of humility that you have for yourself. And ultimately, I think that that benefits patients when you can say, I don't know. And I guess if you go to the C, um, you might make a really bad batch of something. Um, or you don't know what you did wrong. And so what I guarantee all of us will do is go back and try to do it better the second time around, or we will try to figure out what that missing piece was, that missing ingredient. And so I would say that even though you're saying you don't know, uh, saying I don't know, but we're going to try to figure this out together, we're going to try to put this all together, I think um, it is what a lot of us do. And I think some of the best physicians that I've come in contact with. And I know that going through different ailments with family members, I really, really have come to appreciate people that take a holistic and humanistic approach and can sometimes say, I don't know, but never leave that with, there's nothing more that we can do. Um, and I think that that's very, very powerful. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I've done a lot of talks on medical errors. I, I think it's just such a great, interesting error, because, area because uh, we want to get it right. We want to get it right most of the time, but we're held to a very high standard and, and 100% turns out not to be right. And, and in fact, part of the medical process is, um, you know, it, it looks, you know, it, I, I'm sure in your world, it looks like a stroke. It looks like a bleed, but it it's not. It's an infarct. It, you know, it, it things sort of change. Um, sciatica, of course, is a classic story of you have an idea why it might be occurring. Um, but it's not always, you know, what what you think it is. And uh, uh, one of the things I was thinking about about art and, and the neurology world. There's a great slide I use on, you know, a, the bigger talk I do on this, where it's an old painting, and the physician is holding the hand of a woman who's looking very sad, and she's yellow, so she's a little jaundiced. So that's something that people pick up on. But he's holding her hand. And the sub theme on this, the, the background of this first story of, of the painting is the woman is suffering from love sickness. And I, I love this uh, in that it, when we first started off, you know, in, in the medical world, that was a thing. Like there was no DSM three or four, but love sickness was a, a malady. And the person was holding their hand and, and listening to them. And, and I talk about that painting is part of what we do in medicine. And you and I, I'm sure, both do this, especially once you're over the acute phase and, and figuring out what's going on. Sometimes you have to sort of sit down and what's the gestalt of what's going on here? Um, maybe, you know, I, I see people with, you know, it's this thing called trichotillomania. So they're, they're pulling their hair out, you know, and it's a nervous habit. Or they're picking at themselves and they, they may have delusions of parasitosis. And, uh, you know, you know, but but sitting down and gaining trust uh, and figuring out what else is going on uh, is you know such a, an important issue. And uh, I, I mean, I I completely agree, one hundred percent. And to get back to your love for medical education, you know, uh, being a neurology residency program director and being a lot, around a lot of students. Uh, I see no shortage of dermophilia, if you will. I don't know if that's a term or if we can coin it, but uh, trying to get students interested in neurology when dermatology exists is sometimes very difficult. Dermatology seems to be just this uh, attractant field to so many different people, and there's a ton of reasons for that, and, and I'm sure that we don't have time to get into that now, but as a medical educator, um, I guess I just had a, a two-part question. One is, have you ever had any neurophobia at any point in time during your training, or do you see neurophobia? And if, if there is this kind of fear of neurology, or I don't know how to handle some of these complex neuro patients, um, what would you say as a medical educator 
would be some useful tools in helping uh, people get over some of their fears that they may have because the, the nervous system can be fairly complex. The nervous system can be fairly complex. I, um, well, I, I, I can't, I, we were talking earlier, I, I don't like the idea of uh, phobia about anything in um, sort of medicine, right? I mean, you know, clearly you don't want me intubating your patient on a regular basis. You know, I, I in, in a pinch, you can call on me, but um, that's not what you want me doing. That's, that's um, patient phobia. Yeah, <laughs> patients, that's right. The patients and, are more um, scared than you would be. So neurophobia, you know, I, the, the truth is, I'm sure I don't do even as good a, you know, certainly a good, you know, a cranial nerve exam as you or a peripheral nerve exam as, as you. Um, but one of my interests has been wound care. Uh, and, and so I helped run a wound clinic for years. And so um, one of the mantras that someone taught me years ago, an endocrinologist, he said, if, you, if your patient is diabetic, take their shoes off, you know, and, and put them. That, you know, test them, the Sims winding test, or just talk to them and look for callus. Look for, you know, talk about something that is common, common, common with a high morbidity and mortality. That's a diabetic pressure ulcer, a neuropathic ulcer on their foot because their risk of amputation, and once they get an amput, their risk of amputation becomes high once they get that ulcer, and their risk of death becomes high. Um, so that's just a nice, simple area. So, so back to the phobia. No, I, I'm into embracing. I'm into neurophilia. That's what I, I, I'm into loving all of these things. And, and, you know, it's funny. I, I somehow stand, I, I'm at a stand up desk here. So, uh, you know, I, I, I stand for a, a lot of my day and I, I, I like that, but it made me think about, um, like, have you ever had your office just get out of control in a day you're running behind and, I don't know, people are screaming, they're having seizures. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, of course. Yes, right. So, and, and your staff, of course, it, it reverberates. The staff is worried, you're calling it, running a code here, and things are happening. So, do you have something you tell your staff what, what to do? Um, I, I usually ask them to be patient with me, <laughs> and I usually say, we got this. And then I say, do you need a coffee? And then I go grab some coffee and then we regroup and, and take it back to the patient. So I'm going to tie this into neurophilia here for a moment. And what I tell my staff commonly, among others, yeah, I do all those things perhaps, but sometimes I say, okay, you know, we, we, we don't know where Mr. Jones is. We forgot a person in this room and, you know, and things are happening and somebody's throwing up. I say, stand on one foot. Okay. Now this is the neurology part because it ties into yoga, right? If you're going to stand on one foot, so I'm standing on one foot right now, you need to focus for a moment. And when you think about the neurology that goes into that, that's not so easy. That's not so easy to do, but it causes one to focus and perhaps calm down a bit. Because I, I do it for the point of I make them stand on one foot. So everybody just take a minute. All right, now we're going to go get it under control. We're going to figure out who's where. I want everybody looking in every, you know, we, we, we just need to reset the clock. It's funny. I, I think I talked about it even in the TED Talk. You know, one of my mentors taught me that when you go into a patient room, as soon as you walk through the door, you have to, you, you hit the reset button uh, and because you each patient encounter is a new person. And then, um, your world and my world, you might, you know, you might be dealing with a genodermatosis in one room and something that's really, um, you're really worried about in the next room and maybe a malignancy. You know, I, I imagine there's a fair amount of variety um, in a, certainly a general neurologist's uh, office that you see. So. I was going to ask if you've diagnosed any of your staff members with any proprioceptive disorders or ataxia or gait disturbances when you're asking them to stand on one foot. Uh, no, not yet. Um, <laughs> not yet, but I, I'm not sure everybody. Not not. I'm not monitoring to see that they're really doing it, but it's good. So, so th this comes back to the medical education part. I don't know. I mean, I I hadn't really thought about this. What is it? You know, we, we, we should turn this on you, Newper, and find out what you know got you inspired by uh, neurology. But but you know, this this is everything, right? This is visual. This is smell this is hearing this is you know our, our sensory story is, is um 
you know, it, it, it's exciting. I, I, I don't know. I think in all these things, people think that dermatology is exciting or easy or, you know, there aren't that many dermatologic emergencies or who knows why people pick dermatology. I would have never imagined I would have ended up in dermatology. Uh, but here I am after all these, you know, 30 some years of, of doing it. And I stumbled into it because I was doing an epidemiology fellowship that I, I got interested in skin cancer epidemiology, but I thought I was going to do international infectious disease. So go figure. I, I didn't. So back to, back to yoga, maybe it's yoga and neurology or, you know, who knows what, you know. Uh, along the same lines, and, and I didn't put two and two together until about two seconds ago, but, you know, I've always, I think it was um, Dr. Uh, Bolte Taylor, I think, wrote one time about the 90-second rule, um, and basically you have this chemical reaction that happens if there's a stressful situation or there's everything is is kind of uh, awry, and if you take 90 seconds and then reevaluate after that 90 seconds, your reaction to that event is very different than if you were to react right away. And so uh, it's it's interesting. And I wonder, uh, you know, your your one foot rule almost just goes right along with that to just kind of take a pause and use that 90 second rule. And so it's very, very interesting. And uh, I appreciated that a lot. I like, well, I, I think a lot of things sort of depend on the, uh, the pause. I, I think it's good. Um, you can edit this out if you want. I, I shared this on an, another, you know, interview I did recently, but my latest acronym ties in with a few of these. So I, uh, do you mind if I go with this, Nooper? My go latest, right ahead. My latest uh, acronym in terms of whether it's culture of excellence or reducing errors or, you know, I, most of my world is about medical education is check-in. And check-in uh, refers to a few of the things that we've talked about. Um, the first part is the active part of, I hope people are checking into this podcast and, and checking into neurology so they don't have neurophobia, they have neurophilia, um, and they have just a love for being a doctor. I mean, what a great job. You get to touch people, you get to ask personal questions, you get to be part of people's lives in so many ways, whether you're um, catching a baby that, that a woman is delivering or or helping address their stroke or, or dealing with their pain issues or whatever it might be. So anyway, check-in stands for these things. It stands for curiosity, humility, ethics, communication, and knowledge. That's the K. And then the I is initiative and the N is noting. So I'll give you a quick synopsis. So curiosity, the favorite med students I work with are curious. They, they want to know who, you know, they, they don't want me to spoon feed them. They say, oh, that was good. How do I cook it, right? How do, you know, let's do more. What, now you want to talk about art? Let's talk about art. Let's make sure we know how many people live in Ohio. Humility is actually, we talked about it briefly earlier, has been well studied in, if you want to reduce medical errors, have a sense of humility. You know, I, I mean, you can be, you know, um, Dr. House, of course, who was pompous. Humility was not his thing, but that's a TV show. Um, and, and certainly he nailed things with a, a a voluminous bit of knowledge, um, but he didn't necessarily communicate so well. I mean, he was not quite there. Uh, the third is ethics, the E for ethics. We, of course, there are a hundred reasons why that's a good idea. Communication, being able for you and I to communicate as physicians, as neurologists and dermatologists, but all of us uh, to be able to communicate is, is so important. And talk to the patient, listen to all the cues that are going on, explaining what you're doing to the patient. Because if you don't communicate the diagnosis right, uh, that's an error too, uh, to be honest with you. And then the K being knowledge, I like the, it, it's simple. That's what we do in medical school though, right? That we, we, we lay heavy on the knowledge part um, because that's what we know how to test for. But I tell the students, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't, if you're not curious, humble, have ethical principles and communicate well, all that knowledge isn't going to do you so much good. And then I'll give you the IN. The, the initiative part is pretty straightforward, although I think of other words for this. Um, but initiative, you, you have to have some heart in the game and, and want to get up and, and go and do it. And the last part ties into the pause. So that's why I decided to talk to you about this. And it's called, I use it for noting, N-O-T-I-N-G. And noting has two things. One, it's the part of taking notes, keeping track, doing a good medical record, um, keeping track of how you're feeling, uh, journaling. 
but it's also about the pause and, and the pause um, in Buddhist meditation and almost any meditation field, there's this thing and noting is the idea that thoughts come in your head um, all the time and you can say oh that's a thought I'll let it go my brain made that up that's a thought um, let it go and so um, that's the idea check in curiosity humility ethics communication knowledge initiative and um, noting which is that pause so thanks for thanks for letting me talk about it I love it. Uh, I uh, I absolutely love it. And I think it's very relative to a lot of what we've talked about. So thank you for sharing that. And I know that Nooper is probably going to want to do her no brainers with you soon. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, in, in chatting with you, one thing that really resonates with me, and it's just so great to get to talk to different colleagues in medicine, and especially ones like you, where it's very easy to tell how passionate you are about what you do. And um, I, I love what I do. Uh, being a physician is a childhood dream come true for me. Um, and it's just really, really special to get to interact with other people who just love what we do. And I know that I talk to a lot of students nowadays that say, you know, Dr. Blecto, there's a lot that has changed in medicine. A lot of people tell me, don't go into medicine, run away. It's it's no nothing like what it used to be. Um, I, I just can't uh, imagine either one of us ever giving advice to a, a student like that or someone who might have some interest in medicine. And so just uh, hearing the way that you talk about it and the way that I feel about it, it's very infectious. And so I really, really appreciate talking to colleagues like you who clearly have such passion for medicine, passion for medical education. And I just wanted to thank you for that. And I know that it's if it's infectious to, to Nooper and I right now, I know it's going to be infectious to a lot of other people. And uh, I, I the more of us that there are out there, I, I think the, the better it is for people to really get a good feel that we love what we do. We love medicine. We love medical education. And I would not do anything differently with my life if I could do it all over again. I think people like Nooper are going to be the key to recruiting more and more people into uh, neurology. I think there, there's no doubt about that. Um, and uh, do you know Dr. Zarconi from Neomed? I do okay. not. Oh, really? He, he's just a super passionate guy, but but I'm sure Nooper knows uh, Dr. Zarconi, and he, he's very much into the medical humanities. He's helped curate the William Carlos Williams uh, poetry contest every year for through Neomed. At, at any rate, Joe and I sit and talk and say, you know, we the truth is I love being with physicians who love being physicians. So doctors who love being doctors, that's the key, right? It, it's, um, I mean, that is, I mean, my oldest uh, just finished her family medicine residency last year. She loved being a doctor. She's good, you know, and, and the other two are, they're not physicians, but, uh, you know, the on, on the important part of things, you know, it's uh, my closing line to patients these days is sunscreen hats and go make the world a better place. So when people ask me what any of my kids are doing, I said, what they're doing isn't so important, but that they're nice people. So that's the make the world a better place is, is go with nice people. Okay, so sorry to sort of keep rambling here. Newper, give me any one minute uh, answers, no brainers you want. Well, you know, I I am just so appreciative to have this opportunity to sit down with two people that I, I truly look up to so much. And, um, you know, Dr. Masto, I can't tell you how heartwarming it is to be able to ask someone, a dermatologist, not even in the field of neurology, to hear you say that you don't experience neurophobia, but that you embrace it, that you are a neurophiliac, even not even being in the field of neurology, just fills me with so much joy and hope and um, just excitement about the future of, of how we can help bridge neurology with other fields. And so having the opportunity to, to sit down with you and, and to pick your brain about, you know, the connection between these two fields and the way that you approach patients, I think is, is so special. And, you know, to go back to something that you sort of asked about earlier, this, this question of why I'm so passionate about neurology, it, you know, I, I've been reflecting on that. And it, it kind of a lot of the things I love about neurology are similar to your approach in dermatology. I think the main thing is just this, this perfect intersection between medicine and the humanities. And I think that, you know, oftentimes we we derive so much of ourselves, our personalities of who we are from our brain. Um, and that's our, our internal selves. But how we project to other people, the way that they view us, our appearance externally, 
that's our skin. That's that's the way that we come across. And I feel like neurologists and dermatologists have this very special job of, you know, obviously being medically gifted, but also being that bridge, that humanitarian person to help give validation and experience and, and purpose to not only your internal self, but also the external one that you project to others. And so, um, you know, just thank you once again to, to both you, Dr. Mosto, as well as you, Dr. Boletko, for taking the time. It, it, it's been truly so wonderful talking with both of you today. Um, and, and as Dr. Mosto, as you said, um, you know, we like to end all of these episodes with what we call our no brainers. And these are five rapid fire questions that you can respond to with one word or one sentence maximum. So are you ready to go? I think so. And you're off this, Blake. This is all me, right? It's all you. Spotlight's on. The spotlight <laughs> is on you entirely. All right. So, Dr. Masto, what is the best part of your job as a dermatologist? Oh, it, it's being with people. Uh, that, that's all there is to it, you know, and, and helping people. Okay. How do you recharge outside of medicine? Uh, well, I, I'm lucky enough to be married to someone I love. Uh, we've been married 35 years. So being with Michelle is a great thing. Being with my friends and family uh, is good. And we like to travel. We like the things we talked about, art. We like birds. We like being places where there are birds and we like cooking. So I don't know. Those are, we like enjoying life. Life is short. So we try to embrace it. Love it. Um, where do you want to travel next? Yeah, that's such a hard question. I, I it's I, we like travel, um, and um, you know, I mentioned we were lucky enough to have recently been to uh, New Zealand and Australia, and I, I would say New Zealand was stunningly beautiful, and Australia was interesting. The, the only negative is, um, I, I know this is a, a no-brainer question, so but you asked me a hard one is everyone speaks English. I like going places where I don't, the, the language is not my first language, where things are a little more disorienting. And, and um, I, I like places with food. I mean, I, I'm, Mexico City is high on my list at the moment. Um, a lot of people say it's dangerous, but say, they say the food is fantastic. And I don't think it's, I think the danger is like any big city, to be honest with you. So. Okay, so Mexico City, we'll make sure we keep it on our list too. Um, <laughs> how would you describe the field of neurology? Well, I think the field of neurology is fascinating. It's it's highly varied. It, it's um, it it's everything. It's our cognition. It's it's connections. It's um, you you were. I don't mean to give you the the no brainer answer, but it it's the um. There's so many pieces to it. You were talking about the skin you're in, but it, when you see someone approaching, if they have a an odd gait, that affects how you perceive them. If they have a bold gait, that affects how you see them. I mean, you, you learn a lot just from looking at a, a shadow, just like a, a bird. I, I, I think you actually need to give an ABC talk on um, uh, for neurology grand rounds. Um, so uh, I think that'll be, you know, a... Uh, uh, the music just turned on there. Alexa, turn off. Hey, sorry about that. You'll have to edit that out. That's um, okay. But uh, uh, so neurology, I don't know. I, it, it, we, when we spoke about the idea that I have neurophilia, it's really showing my ignorance of not knowing. Maybe I, you know, it shows you how little I know about neurology. But uh, I try not being afraid of anything that we, we had to study in med school. We, we just, uh, you know, recognize there are a whole lot of things I don't know. Absolutely. Long answer, sorry, but uh, that's okay. We can edit it down. Edit me down. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> um, and the last question I have: What do you enjoy the most about neurology? What What do I enjoy the most about neurology? Um, I, I, um, I I do spend a lot of time thinking about you know people who might have diabetic foot ulcers. So. Uh, I, I, I like thinking about sensory experience and, and, and looking for um, neuropathies. I mean, I do spend a fair amount of time on that. Um, and then the other piece about neurology is just perception. I mean, this is, you know, this, this is everything, right? It, it's what we do in medicine. So, you know, keeping all those things going. I'm, I'm hoping most of my cylinders are still firing. And I, I hope 
you'll tell me something I can take to keep all my synapses going someday. It'd be a good thing. We're working on it. Okay, good. I like that. That's good. <laughs> Um, well, Drs. Mosto and Valeco, um, once again, thank you so much for your time. Um, I I learned so much from from this podcast just being here today, and I know that our listeners will also get so much out of it. So we really appreciate your time and your perspective um, on the relationship between neurology and dermatology. Um, you know, and I just want to thank our listeners for listening. Um, and, and if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave us a review and you share it with a friend. Um, and you can follow us on our social media at Neurophilia Pod for updates on future episodes.